It's five o'clock, and so we'd like to call this regular scheduled meeting of the Santa Clara City Council to order. I'd like to welcome everybody who's here with us tonight. Good to see you again. Um, I'm Mayor Rick Rosenberg. We have a full council present, Councilman Jarrett Wake, Councilman Denny Drake, Councilwoman Krista Hinton, Councilwoman Lena Mathis, and Councilman Ben Shakespeare are all here, so we appreciate that. I'd like to begin the meeting with an opening ceremony and Pledge of Allegiance. We've asked Councilman Drake if he'd lead us in that. Would everyone please rise and salute the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our Father in heaven, as we come before thee at the beginning of this city council meeting, we're grateful for the citizenry of Santa Clara, for the help that they've afforded to all of us, for the faith which they have in us and the trust which they've placed with us. We pray that we may be worthy of that trust and move forward in Santa Clara with the uh, blessings of the populace. We're thankful for our staff, for the work that they put into making Santa Clara such a wonderful place to live. We pray that we may continue to receive those blessings. We're thankful for the opportunity of meeting to discuss factors uh, which affect Santa Clara. And as we discuss them, we ask for thy guiding hand to be with us. We're thankful for those that serve on the council and as mayor, and we pray a blessing upon them. And we do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Danny. Conflict and Disclosures Council, is there anything on the agenda tonight that you may have a conflict of interest in that you need to disclose before we get started? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move into the working agenda. There are no public hearings scheduled for tonight. Um, on the consent calendar in front of you, you've got approval in the claims and minutes from the April 13th regular city council meeting, the April 13th executive session, and then the claims through April 27th. And then just remind you of the calendar of events for next month. Uh, the work meeting will be on May the 4th and regular meetings on May 11th and May 25th. Um, council is there, and then we need to set a public hearing to receive public input regarding the fiscal year 2022-2023 tentative budget for May 25th, 2022 at beginning at 5 p.m. So is there any question on the consent agenda? If there's not any discussion or question, I would look for a motion. I move that we approve the consent agenda, which consists of the claims and minutes from April 13th, 22nd, and April 13th, 2022, uh, the calendar events and to set the public hearing to receive public input regarding the tentative budget for, uh, for May 25th, 2022 at 5 p.m. I'll second that. Got a motion by Denny and a second by Krista. Is there any question um, or discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and do roll call votes as a money item, Ben. Aye. Lena? Aye. Krista? Aye. Denny? Aye. Jarrett? Aye. The motion passes. Thank you, Council. Under general business, I've got a justice court discussion. James Peters with the AOC Judge Justice Court Administrator is here, and Judge Armstrong is here. Um, so we will turn uh, over to Scott. Yes, uh, Judge Armstrong would like to take a moment just to introduce Mr. Uh, Peters with the state courts. Go ahead, Judge. Just state your name for the record for me. Uh, Ken Armstrong, Judge Santa Clara Justice Court. Um, as you know, I was here, I don't I think it was a few months ago, and, and stated that I'm going to have to retire in December. And um, Jim is the administrator of all the justice courts up at the administrative office of the courts in Salt Lake. Um, and he's, we have training here, so he agreed to come in. And he just wanted to fill you in on what options you have as far as the justice court, if I leave, and then also maybe what you need to do on some of these options to take, you know, to take care of it. So I'll introduce Mr. Peters. Thank you. Thanks, Judge. 
Thanks, Judge Armstrong. And if I might, uh, not, not just for the introduction, but for the 22 years that he served Santa Clara. Um, I think it's a safe bet that none of you were in office when the, the judgeship was last filled. <laughs> So where we're coming up on a vacancy, I thought it would might be helpful if I could um, come down and spend a few minutes with you to answer any questions you have about the process moving forward and the options that you have. We, we view judges as elected officials, and, and I've been approached by cities and counties uh, about how do we get rid of our judge? We don't want to do this justice court thing anymore. And I'm like, well, you don't get rid of the judge. The uh, the mayor can no more fire a judge than the judge can fire the mayor. Um, but when you're coming up on a vacancy like this, you do have options that, that you wouldn't have otherwise. And I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of all of those and then answer any questions that you have about moving forward in any one of those three directions. So it's not a requirement that Santa Clara have a justice court. Uh, so one of the options that you would have would be to dissolve the justice court. And, and I would help you through any one of these options. It's, it's totally uh, whatever this council decides it wants to do. Um, if, if you were to dissolve the justice court, and I should have come uh, prepared with a little bit more information that, that might have been helpful, and I can certainly follow up uh, if, if it would be helpful. Oftentimes, smaller communities uh, recognize that um, the, the majority of their defendants aren't local residents anyway. So whether they keep the court or dissolve the court isn't necessarily tied to whether it's providing a service to the local residents or not. Um, if someone from Salt Lake is, is speeding down the highway out front, they, you know, they might end up in the Washington County Justice Court, they might end up here, but either way, they're, they're working on their speeding ticket um, with, with a court that's nowhere near their home. So dissolving the justice court, uh, any cases that did originate in Santa Clara would end up in the, in the Washington County Justice Court over in St. George. Um, and those cases would be handled that way. Um, if, uh, if, you, if you dissolve the justice court in all likelihood, you would never get it back. Um, there's a statute on the books that talks about um, creating a justice court, which you would have to do uh, if you wanted to get it back after dissolving it, it'd be starting from scratch. And the threshold requirement for getting a justice court in the first place is demonstrating that there's a need. Uh, and, and you could maybe do that with the Judicial Council, but I would, I would suspect that you'd be hard pressed to demonstrate a need when there's one over in St. George. Uh, in, in my six years with, uh, with the administrative office in this position, there's only been one community that's, that's tried to approach the Judicial Council to create a justice court, and that was Mona, uh, which is seven miles north of Nephi. And they, they couldn't demonstrate that they had a need because their residents shop in Nephi, their kids go to school in Nephi, they go to the movies in Nephi, and so the council thought they could, they could do court in Nephi as well. One way to not operate a justice court, but not foreclose the possibility of getting one back in the future would be to enter into an interlocal agreement. Uh, Washington County Justice Court has interlocals with St. George and several other communities around here. Um, and this could be another one where you contracted in essence with, with Washington County to operate the justice court and how the revenues are split and how the expenses are split, that's all negotiable between you and Washington County. Um, but the difference between doing it that way and dissolving the court uh, would be that if you ever wanted your court back, then you would terminate the interlocal agreement by its terms and you would demonstrate to the council that you were up and ready to go and uh, get, its, get its blessing to, to hire a judge and you'd be off and running again. And of course, the, the other option, which is probably the one that you're looking at anyway, would be to simply replace Judge Armstrong and continue with your justice court. Um, and surprisingly, <laughs> the, uh, the process for replacing the justice court judge takes several months. And where Judge Armstrong's off the bench at the end of December, it wouldn't be any too soon to get started with that right now. 
And I can walk through um, what that process looks like a little bit, if it would be helpful, uh, just to let you know. The, the process for hiring the justice court judge uh, starts with the administrative office of the court. So we put out a press release that says there's a vacancy in Santa Clara. Here's what that, that position would make. Um, here are the requirements for serving as a justice court judge. The difference between having Judge Armstrong and the next judge uh, is that since he uh, took the bench in 2000, uh, there's been a, a law passed that requires that a, a justice court judge in a class of this size, this county, um, have a law degree. So your next judge uh, would need to be uh, law trained. Um, and there's several other things that apply to all judges. They have to be 25. They have to be a resident of this county or an adjoining county. Uh, and there's a couple of other things. But we put out that announcement and we partner with you um, to spread the word because uh, it's, it's amazing how, uh, how few applications we can get even in, a, in a, a city this size, in a county this size. Um, because if we don't get at least nine applications that come through on the first round, which we typically leave open for two or three weeks, we then have to open it up again or extend it or something like that, which takes another two to three weeks. So as I talk through these steps, you'll do the math and you'll see that that's several months. So if we want to have a judge on the bench in January, like I say, it's, it's time to get started. Um, but applications come into the administrative office of the courts. If they come here, they fall through the cracks and those people aren't considered. Um, so we work uh, with, with your HR and to make sure that everything sends, gets sent up to the administrative office. We vet the applications, make sure they meet minimum qualifications. And while that's all happening, we're putting together a nominating commission. Um, and the nominating commission consists of five people. Two of them come from Santa Clara. Uh, one of them comes from the local bar association. One of them comes from the local mayor's association. And I don't, I don't know what that looks like down here, to be honest. I assume there's, there's something that you have. On the chair. Get together and go to lunch or whatever. Um, I meet once a month. Yeah, okay. So that group would, would put somebody on the nominating commission. In fact, we just went through this with Washington City not that long ago. So that person that you appointed then is probably still eligible to serve. Uh, and then what's the fifth position? <laughs> We've got the mayors, uh, and then the county appoints somebody as well. So other than the two people from Santa Clara, everybody that was appointed from those other three to serve on the Washington City Nominating Commission uh, is probably still in place. So that nominating commission could come together fairly quickly, but even then, it's always a challenge to get those five people uh, committed to a schedule where they get together the first time and they go through all the applications that have come in and they decide who they want to interview. And then they get together a second time and they conduct those interviews. And what their charge is, is they, they come up with a slate of three to five nominees that they then pass on to the mayor. Um, and and uh, Mayor Rosenberg makes his, uh, his selection and then presents it to this council for, for your uh, ratification. So the nominating commission takes a month or two to do its thing after we've taken a month or two to advertise the position. And then he has 30 days to make his pick because he'll want to interview people and do background checks, whatever. You'll want to do the same and you have 30 days to do that. So by the time we add it all together, we're you know six to eight months uh, into the process. If the judge that you ultimately select is already a judge somewhere else, because justice courts have part-time judges, um, that person doesn't need to go through an orientation that we have in Salt Lake City to be certified by the Judicial Council to serve. But if they haven't been a judge anywhere else, uh, then there's an orientation that we would do in January, uh, run them through that week, um, make sure they pass the test and understand what they're doing. And then we take that name to the, to the Judicial Council for their approval. And as soon as they do that on the it's different in January because we have the, the holiday and, and the, the, the session starting, but it's about probably the third Monday or Tuesday in there. Then as soon as they're approved, they could take the oath of office and, and take the bench. So even, 
even as carefully as we want to orchestrate this, there's a possibility that you'd you'd have a gap between Judge Armstrong and the next judge of about three weeks. And we'd just work with other judges in the area to, to cover. So that's the nutshell of it all, but what questions do you have? What could I explain better uh, about those options? And, and especially the one of replacing Judge Armstrong. Questions, counsel? You explained it quite well, thank you. Um, to start the process, do we just contact you? Mm -hmm. okay. I'm not the one that actually staffs that nominating commission. There's someone that works with me that, uh, that kind of gets things going, but uh, she's buried with work. I, I'm typically the one that puts that uh, announcement together, make sure it meets with your approval before we release it to the press. Um, but, but you know that's easy enough to put together, and we can get it out as soon as you want. And, Judge and it wouldn't hurt, frankly, to to do it a little bit sooner than later, because once we run into the holidays, sure, uh, November December gets gets hard to get much done. Do we have your contact information? Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Council questions. Is the orientation only done in January? No, uh, we do it to, typically in April, August, and January. Okay. Um, to do it much sooner, like I say, we'd, we've we rescheduled them before to accommodate, um, but to reschedule into December or November probably wouldn't help much. So January would probably be the one we're shooting for. And it would be very difficult to get it done in time for the August one. And then you'd have a judge on the payroll for four months that, you know, that, that'd be too much overlap, I would suspect, but we could talk about that if it were of interest to the, to the council. Any other questions? Just the process from the city side, is this something we'll discuss or is this something? Well, we've talked about it a little bit um, about judge's retirement. I think we'll probably go ahead and get started with the process. Um, we'll probably talk about it at council if they want to dissolve the court. The three options that he talked about. Yeah, and I'm definitely not here tonight to demand an answer. So I just wanted to I'll probably put that get on. the discussion going, and yeah, I'll be that first meeting in May just for discussion. Yes, I probably would be good to get started with whatever we're going to do. Yeah, and and with like I said, all the options there again, I know very little. I obviously, it'd be good to go over budgets and costs, and I know Judge spoke on cases they see, and so it'd be good to have that discussion sooner than later, knowing those timetables. Well, and, and you have an interesting challenge before you because different communities have different motives for having a justice court. Uh, on the one hand, there's an analysis that looks at the revenues and the expenses and, oh, we're losing money, let's get rid of it. But on the other hand, there's the, well, you know, is this one of the services that we wanna to provide to our community? And then that's where I can delve into numbers and say, well, actually you're mostly serving St. George, but. <laughs> Um, or, or, or whatever. Um, so at, at whatever cost, there are, there are communities that, that want to provide the court. And, uh, and at whatever cost, there are other communities that don't. And it just depends on, on your philosophy and your analysis and, and how you want to go about it. But uh, I'll help you with whatever you decide to do. So, okay. All righty, sir. Well, thank you. We appreciate okay. you coming down. Yep, you're welcome. Did Sean Guzman get a hold of you? Not that oh, I remember. That deer in the headlight look right there. Nope. <laughs> okay, don't be surprised if he does. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, item C2, discussion regarding stats and strategies for the future. Chief Flowers. Good evening, Council. Um, I've got our new Lieutenant, Karen Studley, and our new Sergeant Tobler here. Uh, we just promoted them last week, and um, Detective Tobler, now a sergeant, we're going to move Jessica Bate in as our investigator. We're pretty excited about those changes in our department. But what I wanted to do tonight is we've uh, been going through an exercise that started a couple of months ago about assessing what we do, how we do it, and I wanted to bring some things to the council to get any guidance or direction. Uh, we've got a 
a presentation. We couldn't send it to you because uh, you have to drill down in some information and we want to show you a little bit about what's going on in Santa Clara and why we do what we do. It take about, oh, you know, I don't know, 10 minutes here because you're going to have questions when you look at it. Can it kind of give you an idea of what's happening, what's been happening since we formed up, how our, our calls are going up. And I just want you to be aware of what's going on there and uh, how we've built our strategy to, to deal with the next year or two years and see if that's on target for what you want. Yeah, you may want something a little different. And so we're making some adjustments in the department and we'd like to get some feedback from it. So um, Sergeant Stelly is going to, what he's going to do is he's going to show you the city of uh, Santa Clara and he's going to uh, show you how our, what our, kind of what our crime looks like from vandalism all the way up to DUIs, where they're happening, you know, kind of show you the trends. And it'll just give you kind of that 50,000 foot view. It doesn't feel too much of the detail that I'm willing to absolutely get to you, mano y mano, if you want to sit down and come in and talk to us, and show you certain things that are probably more appropriate for that. But uh, Sergeant, or uh, Lieutenant Stanley, if you want to go ahead. Good afternoon, Council Mayor. We just wanted to show you this um, breakdown in Word, but it kind of goes over the call volume that we've had. And if you can see down here where my arrow is, I don't know if you guys can, you can see that. So in 2013, this would have been the first year combined that we would have had stats that wouldn't have been one city versus the other. So in 2013, you can see that we had 3,731 calls of service for the year of 2013. And as you can see, as we progress here in 2021 was the last reporting year where we were able to, there's a constant uptick. We're in a we're in an advanced upward towards our calls of service. So you can see where we've kind of hit a plateau right here. And I wanted to kind of explain that to you. And that was due to COVID-19 and the restrictions that were placed and the precautions that we took as a police department um, with our interactions and physically responding to deal with people. We limited that so that we weren't coming in contact with people. And in doing that, we took part of our, um, those EMS response on that, Alpha and Bravo calls, and we we no longer responded to those where they weren't necessarily life threatening. So as you can see that right here, we broke these down um, per officer per year for calls for officers that take calls. We had roughly just under seven hundred um, calls per year per officer for our department, and that roughly translates to about fifteen calls per day that the police department fields or that they staff. So in doing that, we wanted to show you a breakdown of the um, calls that you can see. And Captain Rogers was able to put together a pin map that shows the calls between Santa Clara and Ivins. But we wanted to specifically focus on the Santa Clara City calls for you as a council and mayor to see. But if you zoom in here, you can see, and again, there aren't any there aren't any areas that are necessarily hot spots per se. They are, they are kind of generalized and all over the place. And you can see that they're kind of downtown and you've got down here in the Valley versus up here on the Heights and then up here in this, this newer development area. So what we've done is we've been able to break these down into call types and again, just due to the nature of some of these calls and what they are, I don't want to, if I hover on them, give you an address, and those are probably a little too intimate. I don't know if that's something that we want to click on in, in a city council meeting. But you can kind of see where they are. Um, let me click on one on a street so you kind of understand that. So if you see where it's got a cross right there, it means that there's multiple um, incidents that have been reported there. Those would have been traffic, most likely. So if I click on those, it'll kind of tell you that there was a suspicious vehicle, that's where it was reported. Um, and again, this is for 2021. We don't have 22 compiled yet. Um, we are anticipated from, from the numbers, and again, we haven't had summer hit yet, but we're at 1,800 so far this year. And so we think we translate it roughly to be about an 18% increase from what you've seen from 2021. But if you can see that, um, Right now it's clicked on everything, but if there were one that you guys had a, a question on that you wanted to see, show, but show them the verbiage. Show them the verbiage. 
often in school. Don't this just to give you an idea. There's a reason why I'm showing you all this because it's all over the map. It's not just any one place. And that goes to our strategy. Uh, and I'll explain that to you here in just a minute. Uh, give you a of those areas. Residential areas. Well, thank you, and so in those areas, if I back out of the map, you can kind of see that again, there's not necessarily a pinpoint area or a hot spot that, that we necessarily have. But if you click on this, I think we're safe. I think we're safe to click on my foot, right? Not someone's residence. Chief, you when, when you say this, the 700 calls are per officer per year, is that including Ivan's or is that just Santa Clara's numbers? That would, that would be both. Okay. Center, it's really interesting. Our numbers are rising. Uh, we'll get a little more vandalism around our parks. Uh, so it's pretty much both cities. So and this would be up on the heights that you can see. And, and then, again, the reason why we're demonstrating this to you is you can see we don't have just like one neighborhood where everything is going on, which is actually pretty good news, to be honest with you. Criminal mischief is in our park, and that'll tell you how many we have so far. Uh, what we've done with that. We're, I know that uh, Scott's been working with some of our suspects in a couple of those, giving them some pretty good time. But um, if you go through, again, every crime that we have, we've met. Everything that we do is right there. Uh, we can give you the address, the call, and, and the name. And what we do as part of our strategy here is we sit back every year and look at this as where can we expect our issues to be. Uh, I, I suspect that probably as, as a spring gets into a full pick here and we start getting our trailheads. Every year we start having problems with vehicle burns in our trailheads or in our parks. We've had some problems when we have large tournaments that go on late at night. We'll have people walk through there and break windows and take those kinds of things. What that means for us is that we key into that and we say, okay. We know this happened last year, so what we'll do, it's like, for, I'll give you an example, shooting in the, in, in the South Hills. So what we've done is to uh, say, okay, we're gonna sign officers up there, and then what they do is they report to back to us the time they spent up there and what they did. Then I come back and report to Bob or others who are interested in that information, so you know, if you remember a few months ago, I came and told you how much time you've been spending in the South Hills. That holds us accountable and report back to you. And I'm able to, through our sergeants and lieutenants, say, listen, we're, we're getting a lot of these, uh, uh, for instance, 911 calls, we need to go talk to the businesses. And, or the wind blows, we'll get a lot of, uh, you know, uh, alarms set off by the wind. Uh, so, so now what that does for us in law enforcement, what you kind of do is you look at, okay, if you're a large city, you'll look at different kinds of approaches. You know, say like, like in Salt Lake, they'll break down their city into four different areas. You have four different issues, like you might have, uh, like on the west side, you have certain things on the east side, have other things, and they'll put committees together. But we're not that size. So, what my approach has been, and it's been pretty good, is we take kind of a holistic approach. We look at, okay, where should we be putting our time and money? And I could, I've kind of, felt, kind of proposed to you that we should be putting our time and money in the offices. And they've got to be able to do more than one thing. So, if they get a call, for a burglary or a fraud, they know what to do with it. It requires follow up, and then we would turn it over to our detective division. So we we haven't really sat down and said, okay, we're going to sign an officer like neighborhood watch kind of process. We haven't done much of that uh, because there hasn't been a compelling need. So if you see our burglaries all over, we're going to go down and say, okay, what what was that burglary? Hmm. A lot of the times we'll find out it's a neighbor or uh, a relative of those kinds of things, and so. The prime approach to that is really just, you know, just doing, a, doing the investigation. Today, you know, like, here's another example of what we'll do. So we'll, we can show you where we make our drug arrests. We can show you things in there, and then we'll, we'll see problem homes. And then what we'll do is we'll actually focus. It's kind of a targeted law enforcement approach, kind of a problem-solving area. So what we'll do is we'll spend more time. I know that Sergeant Stedley, when he was a sergeant, I was a He'd actually do things like sit in front of the house and write reports. We want them to know that we're there. This isn't about secret kind of surveillance. This is, we're all worried about it. We're going to be all worried about our reports. And we'll work with our neighbors. We will do certain things. And so we take that approach. Sometimes it can open you up to criticism. 
there's different things that many people think they're being a little bit harassed. But we don't do anything that's outside the law. And so there's no problem with them knowing that we know what they are. And uh, so that's been kind of what we're looking at. Um, we, we, we spend a lot of time uh, on Fridays and Saturdays and stuff doing our DUI enforcement for CRP UIs are all over the place. They're not in any way, they're not on the main street in Santa Clara. They're in our neighborhoods, they're in our parks. So it's pretty hard to say, okay, we're going to take two officers, that's going to be your focus because it's all over the place. So that's sort of uh, what I think. Now, we've also, if you look at what our officers do here, we have state certified uh, drug enforcement people. We have the K9. We have one that you know is because you funded it. Uh, we were one of the first officers of the first departments of our size to have cameras. So uh, you know, we take great pride in being completely transparent. You want to know something from us, we'll show you. You want to see the books, there they are. You want to know our approaches, here they are. Uh, so I think we've done really great work there. Lieutenant Stubbing is the one that really went to got us accredited, so that shows that we're doing everything really right. Now, I want you to have some comfort in the fact that we, we go about what we're doing in the old and we're just not going anywhere. We're just going to come to work, go out there and see us out. We come in, we brief up, we officers have goals. Uh, we've developed uh, the reporting system back to us at the time being spent. If you remember uh, many years ago, we first formed up, everybody was how much time we spent over at well, it shows that we've been uh, very responsible. And if, I got to tell you, if you were to show the items now, it's the same thing. It's all over the place. We had a city council person who was a big argument about crime and, and uh, housing density. We were able to show that's not true. Uh, we don't have any more. Like, for instance, in our vacation rentals, we don't have any more calls there. We didn't get as many. <laughs> so we feel really good. We've got the stats to show that. So folks like, when you bring in all these places, you're going to get a lot more time. Our stats are not showing. So uh, that would be information for you all. And, you know, really, I don't want to take any more of your time tonight. I, I, like I said, we'd love if you wanted to come in and really drill down on these. We'd love to have show it to you. And I'm not looking for recommendations tonight. I'm going to sit down with Rob and Scott and say, hey, what do you think? Is there anything you'd like to see us do differently? Another reason why is we're going to have to look at some officers. Uh, you can see it going up. If you want to keep the same kind of levels of response times, uh, you know, through the service that people are citizens become accustomed to, we're going to have to put some things in the law enforcement meetings. I would say that. But if you think back to the pandemic, especially on the long term, I've asked the text early not to go too long on it because it'll swap up addresses. And if this is a public meeting, we go to certain sites. So I'm going to give you a good view. That's everything. Really good. Cool. Any thoughts, questions? Uh, if you want to send me a copy of something like that? I've got, I've got a couple. Go for it. In 2013, how many officers did you have when the when the cities joined? Do you remember? Yeah, we had ten. And how many do you have now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are parts of the we've not we've added an officer this year, and uh, we gave up a school so we're able to take that officer in there. Uh, I don't make the press with personnel lightly. I'll bring in the justification, show you, but I'm thinking we probably need to look at the next four years hiring hiring these three officers. And not that you're beginning to make it a little bit maybe more than you. And uh, where we're getting into issues is with our detective. How many how many cases do you did you normally carry? It's carrying 30 cases. Now that's about average, but you don't want to be more higher than that. So what we've been trying to do is get into our control and get some of the assignments and some of those, but that's only been six so far. We're looking at another detective, maybe another full time employee in our adversary, just an administrative case we need to look at. And at least two more police officers in this country. I've talked to Scott about it a little bit, I'm not some, and um, hopefully we'll get out. I don't want any surprises. And you know, 
put those objects on the car. Well, well, and the number, and the reason I ask that is that's where the, I mean your calls are up sixty percent, and so you start looking at that. That's why I ask that question, Chief. I guess my main question is where, where do you see the need? I mean, you you're patrolling these. I, I mean, I think each of us have. You know, I live close to Santa Clara Drive, and and know the cars race up and down. Some live closer to Pioneer and see that same thing. And I'm sure Ivan's residence. Uh, we've been careful because I don't want to go to the agency that becomes an agency that you know is traffic focused. But we're going to have to probably look at that. Uh, we've we've uh, the traffic is one issue, and I'm uh, like we did a. Uh, I think I told you a couple of three weeks ago we did a, a, an amendment in the crossing laws. I'm really surprised. That Completed was the last So I think there's an educational process that we've done the citations that we may have to look at. Uh, I'm worried a little bit about our investigations, but I can tell you my number one issue that I am worried about is really not, it's how we're going to maintain the two part pay competitive and two part long term options. I say that there's a typical point, we've been pretty competitive, but uh, we need to do a little cost analysis. I absolutely have thought that a couple of times uh, popping up some ideas. Every agency is looking at that, but we are, we, we put a lot of money as really wonderful people that I'd like to see stay there. That's one issue. I think if, I don't want to speak for these folks, but I think we've been treated really fairly, but we've got to make sure our officers see a career here beyond uh, like coming here to stay. And they do need to be able to make financial plans, those kinds of things. Work. That's going to be our number one thing. Paying and keeping our folks. We've been very, very successful because we've been, it's kind of like the rule of warfare. Uh, we keep an eye on everything. We, you know, we, we need about monthly and we talk about this. It's a little bit ordinary story. Right now, we're doing okay. I got to be honest. But I'm kind of looking at the future being able to make sure we can make this place. We're trained well. We're able to meet all of our demands right now. Very good Are you fully staffed now, Chief? Yeah, we're, 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 we've got one officer, uh, we've got one, one opening right now, but we're being very particular. Applicants that we're looking at, which when one's getting married, we kind of make it that. But the two already trained officers already go through the academy in the area. And one I really want bad, I'm going to negotiate the other one. We had one officer that really wanted to come. Yeah. That's, that's not the new all the years. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. Council, any other questions for the chief? I just want to see if you have an opinion on our justice court, if we should continue or contract out, or oh, do you want to speak to that? I've heard a lot of reasons, but I love it. I think we should keep that part out of it. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I think I just want to make a comment. Of, I appreciate what's been going on in Santa Clara and, and Ivan's with protection and even with the traffic complaints that we hear periodically, I mean, it's not to an extreme. I don't know, other than the high-speed chase we had down yeah. the main street, I, I think everything is being taken care of and, and watched for. And I was appreciative that there wasn't somebody watching the crosswalk that I went through the other day. Yeah, you don't want that ticket. No. That's well, there was a, I didn't see her. She was standing in front of the car and didn't see her at the crosswalk and just went on by. But uh, well, fortunately, the car behind me saw her. We actually put uh, Sergeant Briggs in the crosswalk, so his life was at risk. The rest of us just sat back. <laughs> I will tell you something about speed that's kind of interesting is we, we've been running uh, surveys. Like, we'll get the complaints. We did one up there on Crestview, and up, but they don't have a speeding problem. They think they do, but we were amazed at how well people drove up there. There wasn't a speeding problem. 
So anyway, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Thanks, guys. Appreciate all of you, what you do. Thank you. Okay, item C3, consider approval of the UIA Utopia hut location easements. Matt? Yeah, this item is pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, I, I do need to mention one thing. Um, Jim's report uh, to the council mentions uh, an interlocal agreement with Utopia, which I, and I apologize, I didn't notice this until today, but this item on the agenda includes the agreements for the two easements, but it doesn't include the interlocal agreement. So I mentioned this to Brock before the meeting, we'll put that back on for approval at the next city council meeting. But for tonight, uh, what the council, what we're looking for approval from the council on is two very straightforward um, easement agreements uh, that identify the location of two huts um, on city property where uh, Utopia will locate huts to service their uh, fiber optic network. Um, staff has reviewed um, the locations, I think has been on site looking at the locations, has approved all of that. The forms of the agreement is, is fine. I've reviewed those. And so we're just looking for a city council approval on those items. Where are the locations? <laughs> So the, you know, you go. no, go ahead. So the location one, first one is on Circle Drive at the Circle Drive Fire Station next to the cell tower that's there. So it's just going to sit in its own space right next door. The other one is in Goobler Park, right, uh, running along the trail that comes from Rachel Drive. And it'll sit next between the trail and the fire station block wall, right? They're just east of the gate that they have that can go into their to the fire station. So are the two locations. So the easements is just running right up there in between the, the wall and the trail. And then from Circle Drive, just bending back on that access to the cell tower. The one on Circle Drive, I think they've been marking it right now. They were marking it when I came down. The locates. Yeah. Is there something above ground that we're going to see with the huts? So what is it we're going to see? I think it's a... Like is it a concrete pad with a with a hut on it? So you'll see a you'll see an actual hut, you know, with a door and that that they will have equipment inside of. Oh, it's a it's a bigger building. Probably, a, I assume, like a fiberglass or or uh, I don't know what it's made out of. Maybe Jim can. There, it, we there's it's a rock aggregate exterior. I believe is what will be on it oh, okay. at Circle Drive. They also will have a generator. That will be there. Uh, I believe it's a natural gas generator. It'll be there that uh, in case power failure. At Circle Drive, it will be just enclosed by a chain link fence. I believe at uh, the at Goobler Park, though, it'll be done by a block wall. We'll encase that one. So that's correct. And the wall will match the fire station wall, the, the block wall enclosure there at the park. Gary, is it similar to the, like at the when we did the power tour, the one we opened up, probably something similar to those when we talk about a hut or are they bigger? Yeah. I, I don't know if you've seen the one that's by the fire station on circle drive, but it's just a concrete building with a, a exposed aggregate on the outside. But okay. Kind of really, there's kind of nice bigger looking, them. but, but there is no chain link fence going to be on the one on circle drive. The last, our last meeting that we had, they didn't see that there was a need to enclose it with a chain link fence. I don't know. We just saw the map. A lot of criminal mischief going on up there. At least, yeah. <laughs> no, and there are there are some that we I saw in some of the pictures when they showed what they look like. There's some right next to parks that have nothing yeah. enclosed. They just had maybe some uh, like balusters there just to protect the generator and some of that. But how loud is the generator? The one that's going on circle. I want to say the one time we met Gary. You remember he said they didn't. They were going to. Yeah, they're they're a small. It's a small generator. They're only like 125 amp service. That's so it wouldn't be it's loud a small enough generator. to annoy neighbors. No, and they're and they're placing it on the the opposite side. So the 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 hut will be in between the generator and the the residence. So the generator will be facing the cell tower. Okay. Then the building will be in between that and the the, the home to the uh, to the west of that. Okay. And it's only used when the power goes out. Yeah. Okay. They Correct. they will run them. They'll exercise them yeah. probably monthly. They'll probably have a scheduled uh, exercise with them. 
Uh, the other thing I'll mention is that both of the easement agreements provide for an annual uh, an annual fee, an annual payment. Um, and remind me, Jim, you actually worked on the amount. Do you want to talk about that for a minute? To half a dozen cities and only got three responses, but the the typical annual amount is three hundred dollars per site. I did find out Orem City got five hundred dollars for their site, so it was pretty minimal in the in the difference in costs. But uh, Clearfield did three hundred, Sandy did three hundred, and Orem is got five hundred for theirs. So. And ours are at three hundred for each site. Yeah. Any other questions, Council? Okay. Um, is they are approving the the easements. Yeah, it's two separate agreements. They're identical, other than the location, um, and so probably just have uh, your motion to approve uh, approve the agreements for the circle drive and the Googler, Googler park sites. So okay. council, are they ready to make a motion? Yeah, I can mayor. So I move that we approve the UIA location easements, um, particularly the one at circle drive and the other at Googler park. Second. Got a motion by Jarrett and a second by Denny. Um, to approve the two locations for the UIA um, hut location easements at Circle Drive and Goober Park as presented. Any question on that motion, Council? Um, let's do roll call just in case. Jarrett? Aye. Denny? Aye. Krista? Aye. Lena? Aye. Dan? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Council. Item four, discussion regarding Title 17, Chapter 17.16, Land Use Authority. Jim. Thanks, Mayor and Council members. Uh, Matt and I have been working on some code updates, and we wanted to bring this one before you and have a discussion. Um, it probably would have um, happened earlier in April, but we weren't able to have a work meeting in April, so we're here before you tonight. Uh, the council may recall that we recently made some changes to chapter 1712 for planning commission that kind of ties in with this a little bit we did that on march 9th and we wanted to have a discussion on this item tonight because it's pretty important that we come up with a chapter that's clear and concise and really kind of identifies the different processes that we need put in place for land uh, land use authority if we can go down to the draft and and i'll just discuss that um you can see here, there are a few changes that we're proposing, um, a couple new titles, a couple new sections, 1716.070 and 1716.080. But first I'd like to just, if you could scroll down just a little bit right there, 1716.020, we've got a couple um, changes here. Uh, we're taking out the term second dwelling and putting accessory dwelling units uh, in the title here or in this section. And then item 5A, building setbacks and distances from lot lines or other buildings of one foot or less. That's pretty common for an administrative type of review of city staff to look at something small of a foot or less, not necessarily approving a four foot variance where an eight foot setback is required. Generally, we're looking at something quite a bit smaller than that. Um, if we could scroll down to, to the next section right here. Um, this is where we make reference to the Planning Commission being the land use authority to hear and act on land use applications as set forth in 1712-090, and those are delegated to the Planning Commission by the Council. You can see the strikeouts there. That section was put into 1712-090, which this is referring to, or the Planning Commission chapter, taking that out of this chapter. If we can scroll down um, right here. Um, 1716.050, appealing a land use authority decision. So we've, we've added quite a bit of language here in this particular section. Uh, the first sentence says, the appropriate appeal authority, according to the type of appeal, is set forth in this chapter and delineates this authority between legislative and administrative proceedings. So if we go to the next page, 
this is where we're doing that. So we have a legislative appeal authority and an administrative appeal authority. So the legislative appeal authority are appeals from land use decisions that are identified as legislative matters and subject to legislative proceedings and they're defined. And those appeals go to district court as per Utah code. So those would go to district court and the types of those legislative matters that would be subject to those type of proceedings would be a general plan amendment application. If we had someone appeal that, a land use ordinance uh, uh, amendment application, including zoning ordinance, which is what we're discussing tonight, as well as our subdivision ordinance amendments. The most common probably is a zoning map amendment application or a rezone um, where an adjacent property owner or residents feel aggrieved of, of the decision that has been made for rezoning a property. Item four, an official map amendment application, temporary land uses, combined land use map and zoning amendments, and then seven, all other code sections and uses as specifically delegated uh, by the city council. So the next section talks Jim, about a minute. Sorry, Jim, Yes. before you go on to the next yeah. section, I'll just point out that all of those decisions that are appealed directly to the district court, those are all city council decisions yes. because they're legislative decisions. Right, so right. The, in, in the next section, you're going to talk about it's actually potentially a mix um, because there may be some that are, they're all administrative, but there may be some that are staff. There may be some that are planning commission. Correct. Et cetera. Thank you for the clarification, Matt. And yes, item A, those are items that are generally recommended to you by planning commission. And then the council takes action, and votes on those items. So the next item, administrative appeal authority. Um, and so this talks about, it also refers to Utah code. And we have the language here, the city has appointed an administrative hearing officer as the city's appeal authority to hear appeals from. So by changing the code here, we would be going to a hearing officer um, to, to hear appeals. And they would be these type of appeals as indicated above, uh, a variance, uh, you know, an appeal of a variance from a land use decision, conditional use permit, appeal, a building permit or application, determinations regarding non-conforming uses and non-compliant structures, determination of violations of stormwater ordinances and any civil fines or costs imposed, appeals from a fee, appeals from a fee charge in accordance with Utah State Code, and all other applications for any necessary approval permit or license required by the title. And then the last one says all other code sections and uses as specifically delegated by the city council. Now, here I think the most common appeal we may see is a conditional use permit appeal. Um, Matt, did you have any, would, would you agree with that? Or what do you think the most likely appeal they would that would administrative hearing officer would hear? No, I, I tend to agree with that. I would just point out that that uh, this does include building permit approvals. Yes. And so um, the building code itself actually does have an appeal, uh, an appeal process. We may, we may need to look at that a little closer to see if that's something that we need to accept out of this, but we can talk about that. Yeah, the other types of appeals I've seen are appeals of uh, administrative decision. Yeah. So a decision that a staff member could make on maybe a site plan review or a setback matter or um, something, you know, non-conforming uses, something that predated the code, maybe an interpretation was made um, that a structure was there prior to the land development code. Therefore, the zoning authority or zoning administrator determined it to be compliant with the ordinance. But then perhaps some of the adjacent residents decide to appeal that decision because they don't agree with that matter. So that would be appealed to a hearing officer. And uh, in a nice way, I didn't get into details, but I just kind of described one I went through recently <laughs> the yeah. last couple of years. But that is fairly common to have an appeal of an administrative decision uh, going to a hearing officer. Um, if we go to the next section, 17-16060, it says appeals from land use decisions. And so this gets into time limits. And this is important too. And, and this is something where we'll need to be consistent on the time limits because um, in a lot of cases, we have 10 calendar days here, not 10 business days or 14 calendar days. I've seen that interpretation go back and forth. I like here that it says 10 calendar days, um, not you know 14 calendar days equals 10 uh, business days. 
So this is right to the point of 10 calendar days for them to submit the appeal of the adverse order. And this gets into the requirements or determination for filing a written notice of the appeal. Previously, it said uh, building official. Uh, Matt and I thought we should put planning manager there at the Santa Clara City Building uh, Department office. It's most likely they would come and talk to me and I would let them know uh, what the process is if they would like to appeal a decision, depending on what type of decision it is. If we go down to the next page. Can we scroll down to the next page? Thanks. And so here it's just getting into the process as well. So a decision from appeal, it talks about an appeal must include a list of can continue the names and addresses of adjoining property owners. And so it's with a 500 foot radius of the affected property. Again, the appeal coming to the planning manager. The next item is the fee. We do have a fee that is in our fee policy right now for an appeal, variance, things of those nature. It's $550 plus $1 per uh, notice to adjacent residents. And then we've got a timetable here about scheduling the hearing and uh, putting the hearing together. It talks about 15 days um, in doing that. Um, Matt, do you have anything to add on this section right through here that we're discussing right now? I don't think so. Okay. I thought you may, um, but this is where it says hearing to be scheduled. When a notice of appeal is filed, the appeal authority of the adverse order, requirement, decision, or determinations are scheduled a meeting for a hearing within 15 working days, unless some such time is extended. And I've seen this before too. The application comes in, you have two sides, and you could have uh, attorneys, both sides that want more time uh, to discuss the matter. So 15 days is pretty quick. In all likelihood, it might be closer than thir to 30, and it's a case by case type of situation. Um, but that is something that we would be taking a look at with each case. If we scroll down. Um, action of variance withdrawal or the appeal. Um, and this happens, a lot. this question is asked a lot. If I don't get what I want, do I get a refund? No, we have to go through the process. Um, there's a process there. You know, it's noticed, it's a meeting, uh, a hearing officer. And I meant to talk about that. Um, we would have to um, hire a couple of hearing officers and usually they have a background in law, land use or similar uh, background or area. We would probably have two or three hearing officers, at least a couple. Um, so one hearing officer doesn't hear every case. That's the way I've seen it done. Usually there's uh, two to three hearing officers. That's something we can discuss, but they're not generally an employee of the city. They're not on the planning commission. I'm sorry, they are They are, are a contract employee of the city. They cannot be a planning commission member, a council member, or a full-time employee. They're a con contracted employee that we would utilize at, on an as-needed basis. So, Matt, do you have experience with that? Yeah, um, in my experience, um, the hearing officers have generally been either an attorney or a, or a planning uh, official from another city right um and they and they both you know have their strengths and and so i think i think we have some good options in this area um there are attorneys that are willing to do this i know and you know if there's somebody that we like at another city a planning official or something that that, that might show some interest i don't anticipate that we'll that we'll need this very often right um, we, we might be good with an individual, but I'm just saying a, a backup in case that individual sure. wasn't available. Yeah. And I think that's fine. I, I will just maybe just say that this, just for the council's benefit, one of the main reasons that we decided to, to do this is, um, partly to take some of this burden off of you. Um, you know, in the past, the city council has been the appeal body. And frankly, in some circumstances, that wasn't even appropriate because you were both the deciding body and the appeal body. And so we had some we had some issues like that. Um, we just felt like, you know, the city council has enough on its plate that it doesn't need to hear appeals of, you know, necessarily every uh, conditional use permit or, or variance decision that's made by staff or, or planning commission. So. So we feel like this is a good 
approach is to have this this uh, official, you know, contracted if the need arises. We had one recently that it would have been nice to have a hearing officer in place because yeah. that's where that item would have gone. Yeah. yeah. And then if they are aggrieved by that decision, they can file at district court if they want to take it to the next level. But generally right. it dies with the hearing officer once they render a decision. Um, that's really all I have for this particular item um, to discuss with you tonight. I, um, any questions of council? I <clears throat> maybe just for clarification, but so uh, the administrative hearing officer, is there an appeal other than through the court on a decision made by an administrative hearing officer? It would be with the court. It would be the court. It would be with okay. the court. And, and the information that they have to render the decision on is the information that was available to the planning commission or the other body at the meeting where they rendered or made a decision. The two sides can't bring a bunch of new information that was not made available to the planning commission or, or the city council, depending on the case. It's the information that was part of the proceedings through the process where that decision was made. So that's important I, uh, to call it recollect. That's important to understand too, because, you know, people can say, Oh, I've got this and I've got that now, but that wasn't part of the decision that was made. So, and just to you, Matt, is there, has there been, or is there any problem with that administrative hearing officer not being an elected official with answers to the people? Uh, no, mm -mm. this is, this is specifically available to us under state law. The other thing um, with a, a land use hearing officer, they generally take a week or two to render their decision in writing, making findings and giving a decision, which is really good, that type of documentation. Previously, Board of Adjustments, we don't have one, but a lot of communities have a Board of Adjustment of five members, sometimes more. They hear both sides and they'll render a decision that night. And so, um, you know, I, I like the change to a land use hearing officer. I think this is a good good change and a good way for the city to go. You know, and back to your question, Denny, the administrative appeal officer is appointed by the council, by the elected yeah. official. Right, I understand that. So he may not be elected, but he is appointed right. by the elected body. Yeah. I have a question about the number of days. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You noted 10 days and 15 working days. Do we need to put anything that talk that gives us guidance as whether the, that 10 days falls on a holiday or a weekend or a, mm. and then 15 working days, whose working days? Santa Clara City's working days may be different from my work's working days. I just wonder if you want to clarify that a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, we or, can, yeah. What do you think? We can clarify that. Yeah. I, yeah. The assumption would be that if the 10 days falls on a weekend or a holiday, that it would be the first work day after that. But we can we can clarify that in the ordinance. Well, the 10 days and refers and but then we have the other part later on where it talks about 15 days hearing to be scheduled. Yeah. Notice the, of appeal and, is filed. And 15 so. working days would be the city's working days. Okay. So <clears throat> and then I have a couple Thank questions. Thank you. Can I ask? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you indicated that we could um, set multiple hearing officers. I know we have that conflict of interest policy in there, but do we need to state that we can set multiple hearing officers so that it gives us the option to have more than one? Uh, we could. Um, I know there is some language in there about conflicts of interest um, in in this draft that says, you know, if they, they excuse themselves and we only have one, we haven't designated that we can have another one. So yeah, would it be wise? I mean, in that and in that circumstance, what we would do was we would just designate another one. You know, we would just have to find another one, which which we could do. It might it might delay, you know, the actual hearing. 
because we we have to come back to you and get that approved. But I, it's not, in my view, that's not the end of the world. If that did happen, certainly we could avoid that by having multiples on contract. It doesn't matter. I just thought maybe it might be good to point out that we could allow multiples. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That'd be one thing. Yeah. And then my second question is on the land use authority for delegation of duties in 1716.020 for the planning staff, where we modified it to say accessory dwelling units. I know we, we instituted our new ADU policy and we actually define a difference between accessory dwelling and IADUs. Mm -hmm. Is this only for the one kind, or do we need to note that it's both? Yeah, are? IADUs are permitted in all right. residential zones. So where um, we define the difference between the two, do we need to have this be both accessory and IADU? Well, I think I think what Jim's saying is there isn't a permit required for IADUs. So there is administrative. They just work oh, with sorry. us and yeah. apply. They have to get a, an approval and perhaps a building permit for conversion. But the conditional use is for an ADU. And ADU is per, a permitted use in all residential zones. Oh, okay. The ADU is conditional. It. But it's one we do at an right. administrative level. We take it to TRC and work with the applicant. So. Okay. Yeah. So that would actually fall under a different. Right. Different item. Permitted. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be that they change on us in the next year or two and require the ADUs to be permitted right. too, but we'll see. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions, Council? Um, yeah, I have one. So I'm just trying to think if there was like just an example, like a really controversial project that the Council said no to, does this give the developer not another chance to appeal that where maybe that one hearing officer could overrule what the council decided? Or is it, am I misunderstanding that? I think that would go to district court, wouldn't it? Matt? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it depends on what kind of a decision you're talking about. If you're, if it's a zone change or a final plat, um, those, those would all have to go directly to the district court. Because those those are considered legislative decisions, and so um, it's not appropriate under state law to have an administrative hearing officer review a city count a city council legislative decision. Right. So, um, and that actually that actually works in our favor because courts actually are required to give greater deference to legislative decisions of the city council. So um, now on the flip side, let's say um, one thing we were talking about today is potentially having um, conditional use permits for short-term rentals instead of having the planning commission approve those, having the city council approve those. Since you generally end up seeing those in most cases anyway, in conjunction with a, a PD zoning or something. Um, if, if the city council uh, approved a conditional use permit for a short-term rental, that is not a legislative decision. That's an administrative decision. And so that could go to the, the administrative hearing officer would be appealed to the hearing. Yeah. Officer. So that's why we have them broken down between legislative and administrative. Most of those administrative decisions are going to be staff or planning commission decisions, but there may be specific examples that where, where a city council decision could be appealed, but it would only be if it's not a legislative decision. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, it does help a lot. I've seen it with the rezone too, where the council denies a rezone. And the applicant can wait a year to reapply according to the code, or they could file in district court to appeal that decision. Those are the two avenues they have. A lot of times they'll wait, but sometimes they'll appeal. Yeah. Or ask for a different zone. But and there would be no so, option to appeal that to the administrative right. hearing. No, officer. no. Yeah. I think conditional uses and administrative decisions are going to be the most common appeals. Yeah. All good questions. Thank you. And I will say too, if you have any other thoughts in the meantime, you know, I've just, this is going to the planning commission tomorrow, right? 
Yeah, but it's going to come back to the it's council come in back a few weeks council, for their so final, final decision. If and you have any other thoughts, or yeah. let us know. We can, we can get them integrated. Yep. Any other questions, council? All righty. Thank you. We don't need to take action tonight, right? Nope. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Matt. Mayor and council reports, man. Uh, <clears throat> a couple things, uh, obviously at League and City. So I attended the secondary water. It was basically metering. And as, as we stand, we meter all secondary water, does, and so does the, the canal company. So we are way ahead of a lot of cities when it comes to that. So it was, it was quite eventful. As I sat there, I, it was just good to hear knowing where we're at. But, yeah, as far as what goes in. So that was good. The, uh, I, I had a resident reach out on – traffic signal on let's see it be and i've had actually had a couple of them on on arrowhead and hafen lane this is over by you mayor where it comes in off arrowhead and hafen lane so I, and this is there's two parts to this and and i think the secondary part is probably the answer to this the problem the problem is under our ordinance we won't let anyone build up more than a what is it a three foot wall you come to the front of the property and then you've got to step your wall down is it three or three and a half? The visibility visibility zones on the corner and on the driveway so it depends yeah. on where you're talking so, to the front yard. so this as i drove this and i've driven all through santa clara that might be our bigger problem is we've got hedges going right out and, and that was their concern is they have to come out school gets out and people are flying up and down Arrowhead there. And they're having to inch out there to see, um, to get into traffic when those hedges are up and, and they're literally right out to the edge of the street. So coming out of the subdivision, uh, Hafen Lane coming yeah, out of the Yeah, coming out of that subdivision. Arrow. And then you pick up on the other side of coming, you know, a lot of that traffic's exiting off, off of, uh, uh, you know, coming into the subdivision on, on Hafen there. Anyway, it was just, as I drove through there, I think the bigger issue is site visibility. And this is, I mean, you drive, you know, the kid that crashed into the back of the car on Old Farm, you, you can't see that car parked out on that street because that hedge comes right to the right to the street and it's 12 feet tall. So as we go through it, if we're going to make those requirements for walls and visibility things, I don't know the answer to all this, but, you know, because hedges grow and, you know, we, we plant a bunch of shrubs at the corner there and five years later, the, they're, they're large. But as we get through that, that was a concern that the resident's concern was it's only a matter of time before somebody's going to get hit at either that intersection or Concord there as we, they move down that. So just thought I'd... Throw that. I don't know the answer, but I, I, I think I just based on I drive that intersection three or four times a day, and the things that are problematic right now is there's construction on the home kitty corner from it, and the construction trailer is in the site triangle. Yeah, um, and it's been there for three months. Um, so there's some issue that way, and then the hedge that's on, you know, the the old Christensen home on the west side probably the one you're talking about there. And we've probably got some site distance um, issues that we ought to just pay attention to and make sure the vegetation's trimmed. And when it starts to encroach into the site triangles yeah. that way. One um, thing, yeah, the other, the other thing is just the speed sign on Santa Clara Drive. <laughs> you can't see it. It's well, because got, of the trees. It's got trees, and I don't know if we move it down a little bit or I mean, I know those are pretty expensive, but you, you don't see it until you're right on it. The Wait, um, uh, trimming they're doing on Santa Clara Drive, Brad, is that private trimming or is that city trimming? What's going on today? So the homeowners having that trimming done? Okay. I was wondering if the city was trimming trees, they could go down there and trim that tree. 
It was great in the winter. And then I was like, oh, it's it's gone. <laughs> That's Trees another one. Chip. What location are you talking about? Oh, it's it's right out. It's there's a speed sign right there at the Santa Clara Drive, an old farm. It's on the it's on the north side of the road there. If you're going toward the yard. Okay. Yeah, look at that, because you don't you won't see it until you get pretty close to it. So um, and it's actually well located as far as visibility coming down that road and all of that. So, and I think, uh, Mayor, I believe that is all I have. Okay. Thank you, Ben. There you go. Lena? Okay. I will be brief. Uh, we just completed the fair. I don't know if any of you had a chance to go over and visit the fair, but we were only one of four cities that chose to do a city display this year. Um, us, Washington, St. George, and Hurricane. None of the other cities participated. I think it turned out pretty well. I can, and I have some pictures for Christelle. Um, uh, I met with Will Nadal. Uh, we are pursuing the, whatever we're going to call it, Youth Advisory Youth Forum. City Council, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Um, they have five incoming seniors that have committed to participate. So they've agreed that we're going to meet over the summer. They will design the program and the goals write it all up, and then they will be the five that will participate in it for the first year, starting in August for next year. you have um, budget? I'm going to. Okay. It'll, it'll be very modest. <laughs> A few shirts. And but they're probably going to travel to yeah. Salt Lake, right? In, Jan in January. In January. For the, yeah. yeah. So, yep. Brock's on my list to, to visit with. Um, and then... I did have my, I did have a hack meeting today um, that has a housing action coalition. A lot of the information was a review from the information that they gave out at the League of Cities and Town meeting. Um, the one new thing that came out today though, was they have um, officially started the Southwest Community Land Trust. Um, it's registered, it's up and running. Um, uh, Bruce Jenkins is the attorney that's overseeing it. They are currently writing all of their financial policies. So that might be a really good opportunity. I'm on that committee. Oh, you are on that committee? Mm -hmm. Awesome. That was probably the biggest thing that came out of the meeting today. Um, there's some questions with affordability and Habitat for Humanity and some of the barriers within our community. Um, and I've got some information that I'll bring back maybe the next our next meeting for reports um, on some statistics, um, just because I don't have it prepared since it was this afternoon. And then my last thing is a question for Brad or just information. Um, I had a couple of residents call me. There are three Christmas banners that are still up on the flagpoles. One is you come into town and then two up on. The, they wondered if we could take them down since Christmas is over. <laughs> it's not over for everybody. Coming back. <laughs> Every day is Christmas. <laughs> I said, they actually say Christmas. And yeah, they do. They have the hats and the Merry Christmas. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Uh, and that's all I have. Hey, Krista. Oh, and hey, thank you for covering that meeting. Welcome. And for the new get, city council up. I'll get you I'm all excited the, for I'll that. Get you all the information. Oh, I do need to say reminder tomorrow for anyone who's attending the City Alliance presentation. It's tomorrow from 11 to 1. I've got another conflict, so oh, you I'll and be Brock, there. Yeah. And Brock and Scott have got it. Yep. Okay, that's all. Krista? Okay, well, I wanted to bring to the council that I went to the League of Cities and Town meeting as well and found out that St. George City uses the Interfaith Council to take care of their comments section every meeting and wondered if that would be okay if we reach out to them to help us as well. They're the chaplain. I'm going to be reaching out them, to them to see if they'll help us as well, and um, I will keep you posted. And the vice chaplain approves. Oh, I forgot to ask <laughs> the vice chaplain. Is that all right? Vice? Totally good. Okay. That's the vice chaplain. So. Yep. Great. Okay. And I attended the growth session, and Utah is growing. So I found out that two-thirds of the growth between 2010 and 2020 was actually from within the state, so it's not completely from outside of our area so all those big families mm. there you go. thank you 
Danny? Nothing. Here? Um, I have a few things from the league meetings I wanted to bring up. Um, one was they talked about a municipal ethics commission. Um, I don't think we have one. He said most cities don't, but if there's like an ethics concerning your city, you'd, your only recourse is going to the state commission instead of handling it locally. So I don't even know who to ask about that, but that just piqued my interest because I don't know if we want to just rely on the state for something we could just handle locally. I can I can look at that. Okay, they just called it a municipal ethics commission, whatever that means exactly. Okay. Um, and then in the city council peer to peer, um, Tawilla talked about a mayor's award for local students. And Lane and I chatted with the city councilman afterwards about it. And it's actually, I mean, it's a really cool way to recognize students in your community, but it was also a way to just get people in the seats. And he kind of acted like that was a real benefit to get more people involved because their grandma comes, their teacher comes, their family comes, and they get to see what the city council does on a regular basis. So um, we'll probably look into that a little bit more and see if that's something reasonable we'd like to do, but they really, really recommended it. Um, and the, the basis of it was just the teachers would um, make those recommendations to a committee at the city, and then they got a plaque or something and a little gift bag of stuff from the, the city. And anyway, so it was pretty cool. Um, and then the other thing was um, I went to the class on social media, and it was billed as like how to advertise basically on a shoe street budget, and it turned into a huge legal discussion. And um, I kind of feel like I should probably have maybe a moment in the next work meeting to go over it. But basically the, the big discussion item was if you've ever used your personal social media account, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, whatever, and said anything in your role as a public official, that account is now considered a public forum. And so you can't block people or you'll get sued. You can't delete comments, you could get sued. And so if any of us have ever used a personal account for something city related, it really gets tricky because she's like, what if like somebody posts like your kids are ugly? You, you can't delete that comment anymore because you're a public official and you've used your account in a public function. Josh, you, you can still beat them up though, right? <laughs> 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 so anyways, it just kind of changes like, your account becomes a public forum is basically it's the same thing. If they come here and speak, like you can't just tell them to leave unless they're, you know, being really, really violent or something, you know, like there's very few reasons why you could actually just kick them out. And so. Councilman Shakespeare is going to have to stop posting those TikTok videos. <laughs> He's going to say, I'm going through my tonight. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> and they said, it's very hard to go back. Like once you've, done that there's really no going back so the i mean the, the biggest takeaway from that meeting was like just don't use your personal account for anything like you can set up an account that's like you're a public official and then use that for anything that you want to post or retreat re retweet or whatever but you should never use your personal account unless you're you're fine with having that scrutiny that you get sued if you delete a comment mayor don't worry all of my comments are toward other city councils in other cities never in never in ours so the question i would have is if like we have a website and christelle shares information on it and i've shared that same information with my followers or whatever you call them that's your fats open my yeah. personal account up just yep. doing that just sharing something the city is doing into your personal account yeah I'm screwed, Ben. Yep. <laughs> we'll go down together. And, and yep. she, she listed several like cases here in Utah that are like ongoing. A couple have been decided where there were substantial amounts of money that someone got out of a public official because they deleted their comment or blocked them. So either Brock's got to set us all up in our city Facebook account. Get y'all to delete our accounts Facebook. and I'll tweet. <laughs> so, so anyways. TikTok too, you know. <laughs> Like I said, I'll try to get the slides and then maybe I could just do a real quick rundown because there was a lot of good information in there for how, kind of how to handle it. But she also stated like, it's a really like a do as I say, not as I do because she uses, she was the 
public information officer for Sandy, I think. And she used her personal account for city stuff all the time. But she's like, but I just know that I can't ever delete anything. I can't block anything in my personal account. So you just hope that there aren't really negative things. You don't get a troll that. So let me ask a question. If, if we get an email from somebody on our personal account dealing with city issues, do we just ignore it? Um, they, she only talked about social media, but um, I think there was some stuff there about emails. I'd have to go back through the slides. Is that a yes? You're nodding over there. I, I would say yes. I wouldn't do anything with it. Any response from your personal email? I would just, if you, you had it, I would then respond from your city email. That's what knowing I that you have have that, just I would do my response from your city email, not from your personal. Christelle, I'm going to need a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then just kind of one other quick thing from that that we probably should look into sooner than later was because social media is considered a public forum, we should be archiving that as a city. So if there's ever a lawsuit or something, you have a really quick and easy way to get back to that that thread. She mentioned some cities get sued and like, it's really hard to search Facebook. It's really hard to sort through it. Sometimes you can't even find the data you need to back up your case, but there's several archiving companies that weren't terribly expensive that make that process much simpler. So it's kind of just like archiving our meetings and everything else that should just be included. That's another form of our communication and another public forum. What what social media are we currently using at the city? Just Facebook or do we have other accounts as well? Instagram. And, and Instagram. Yeah. Got a YouTube account. Oh, YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Instagram and Facebook may have a function where you can download all of your all of your past history. I'm not sure about that, but <laughs> so anyways yeah it was kind of a minefield of a discussion but there were several people in the meeting that were just like oh my okay well i didn't realize i was doing that wrong and i'll just have to deal with the consequences so and it may even be something like we train new council members new mayors and i think it's even city staff as far as i know well no sorry no it's not city staff it's just elected officials that you just warn them because like I do have a, a Facebook account that I set up for my election and it's I'm a local politician on that and I use all that for everything for sharing but I don't think most people do that so anyways that's all that I have okay another bright sunshine I know exactly report. thanks Jared <laughs> call, call Chief Flowers tell them to hold off on those officers we've got to pay for some Facebook stuff <laughs> um Dustin attended the MPO meeting for me and um, didn't look like there was too much on there that affected Santa Clara, um, but I do appreciate him attending that. Um, Dixie States um, got a new expansion plan for the downtown campus and a second campus is gonna be built in the desert color area. So just so you know, they're planning a second second um, campus and then electric vehicles are being charged by miles driven a day for your registration, your road uses and gas tax that pass. So for all you guys are driving electric vehicles. I got invited to a the Washington County Youth Coalition um, key, key Leader Appreciation Night. It's on Wednesday, May 11th, um, which is a city council meeting. Um, I don't know if we have somebody that we want to ascend to it since it's on the city council meeting. If we want to have a staff representative or something, go to it. It's out to Tuacon. Um, they ask if we would send a representative from our agency or organization. And um, so Brock, think about it. Okay. I'll give you this stuff when we're done. Um, I went to the league meetings as well. Um, I went to the rural caucus meeting and a, uh, the mayor of Blanding shared an app on his phone that was pretty cool. Um, and it, it's an app, I'm gonna share this with Christelle 
you can, any resident in town can go to this thing and the city council determines what type tier of drought you're in, like green, yellow, orange, red. And it automatically, the way they've got their water rates set up, the rates, when they change that tier, the rates change. So if it's in a green period, you're paying like eight bucks. What typically changes is your base. And it goes from like eight bucks to 30 bucks. Depend, and it does it automatically when the council does their tier changes. And then this app will actually calculate what your water bill would be every month by every tier um, that you could go through and look at. It was, it was, it was pretty cool, but they, they dial their, their residential water, water allotments down by, by season. So they have a summer, a shoulder and a winter. And then those four categories, red, orange, yellow, and green. And it goes from in the summer months, um, in the red, they're down to 8,000 gallons a day. In the green, they can go up to 36,000 gallons a day. Um, in, in the wintertime, it's down to six and stays that way all through the year. And then the shoulder berries too. So it's kind of an interesting way that they had the rates set up. So I'll share this with Christelle and Dustin. You can look at it and and see if it's, the thing I liked about it, it was pretty simple and it changed it automatically depending on the weather and on the water conditions that had been set and council just made that determination what tier they were in. Um, everything else was already defined. So I thought that was pretty cool. No, um, it's not an app, right? It was just on their website. Yeah, it was on their website. I'm sorry. Well, everything I hit on my phone is an app. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so it wasn't like making a whole new app or anything. It's just a part of their website. Yeah, it's just their, it's on their website. You can go to their website link. I'll send you a link. That's what I should have said. Sorry. I'm getting rid of Facebook, so I won't know anything here shortly. <laughs> um, That'll be good. That'll be good to get. Um, the other thing that was interesting, and I just lost it in my notes, but I thought it was a, you know, some of the sessions were good. We had a mayor's session that was limited just to mayors. And so there was a whole room full of mayors. One grenade could have got us all. And um, it was surprising the, um, the similarities of cities and the differences in cities and how they deal with things. And after probably 45 minutes, you could almost look around the room and I could tell you how long the guy had been a mayor and how big a city he was and what kind of issues if it was a gross city or a, or a rural city, just by the answers that they got in their responses and the similarities between the group. It was kind of and really turned into a, a really interesting session um, to sit in on. Um, but a lot of the cities are having the same issues that we are. Um, a lot of them have got issues that we don't have, and it was awesome not to have those issues. So, so it was uh, it was educational. But I appreciate those that went over, and I thought the league did a good job with it. And um, encourage anybody who wants to get involved with the league, they do have some openings um, to submit your name, and um, it can be good. Okay, quick around the staff, Brad, anything? You're just getting trunky, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Gary, are they in? They're in the building. So when Christelle and I left from down there, one of them was in the building and is just kind of getting put in, in the position where it's gonna go and the other one was sitting out on the on the pad outside. So they should be, should be good to go. Uh, the cabinets, um, are, um, I think they've already got the cabinets at Caterpillar, the, um, control cabinet. So that's a good thing. Um, it looks like they're last I heard from Jason, he said to June 1st, we should be up and running. Um, not to say that the SCADA will be where they're still waiting on some electronic equipment too, for the SCADA system, but, but we can still run our generators. If we have to do them manually, we'll do them manually. And then um, I haven't heard anything, any uh, more updates from UAMPs on the uh, Pacific Cores 
um, agreement that we have to get into. Um, she's the, the lady I'm uh, working with that used to work for Rocky Mountain Power says that this is a new program and this is, this is the first application they've received since they've initiated this program. So they're at a loss what to do with it. Prove it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, she says, I told her, I said, well, I think we're just going to run. She goes, oh, I don't blame you. So I think, <laughs> I think we're just going to run. Well, and I would say, I told Gary this morning in our direction, mean, though, I think we have a good complaint if we said that we are already have approval since we had four generators there from the two previously that we already have approval to run for and to generate that power. That's my opinion, but I think we've already had that approval done. So, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll get some more information on that um, from Rachel as soon as I hear. So, and then uh, just one more thing, uh, Eric, or not Eric, but uh, Dan Callahan and Thomas Hillstone are both going to be traveling to the light up Navajo project uh, Saturday. They'll leave Saturday afternoon or evening, and then they've got their training meeting or their orientation meeting Sunday morning. And then Monday morning, they start working. They'll be there for a whole week. Do you know where they're going to be working yet? Um, Fort Defiance. Might be Fort Defiance. Might be where they, I can't remember exactly where they're staying, what hotel they're staying in. But yeah, they'll be in that area. So that's a, that's a great project. I'm How long are they going to be down there? A week. So the, all of next week, they'll be down there? Yeah. Yep. So I'm I'm really proud to be part of that program. It's it's really neat to, to be part of that and help help them out where we can. I mean, it's not much, just two guys, but it's half our crew. We're we're sending half our crew down there. So other cities they're sending you know four or five guys and for two three weeks. But for, for the size of our city, I think we're we're doing a lot. So I think it's great. Cool. Questions for Gary Council? Thanks, Gary. Dustin. I attended a Snow Canyon Compact meeting yesterday with Christelle, <clears throat> and um, two of these six wells up there are in need of some work, and they're actually down right now. So they're looking at um, possibly redrilling one, and then another one that needs bowls and motor and a new building, and and um, hopefully those get done here within the next six to eight months, which means that 24% more water will get out of the compact, and hopefully cut that number back on regional water that's what we're hoping for it was a good meeting very informant so good that's all i have questions for dustin thank you sir chief all right last or this month we attended the our, uh i attended the fire chiefs washington county fire chiefs meeting one of the big topics was because because of the drought the outlook is for fire season obviously is increased so there's publications out there all the way from the governor, lieutenant governor on YouTube. It's called Fire Sense Utah, but it's a national campaign. Mike Milton, the wild regional wildland fire coordinator, I gave a presentation, but um, we're just, you know, we'll probably put something on our website. Just people make people aware of the dangers and there's some advice that they give, but I won't go into that. Uh, staffing, we're grateful for recruitment this month. We're kind of ramping things up. Um, we're excited for the fiscal year. Our staffing is looking good. Um, we're going to be having some interviews next week. So it's exciting for the fire department. And then next week is Mr. Tobler, Captain Tobler's last um, day. He's going to PA school. So he'll be um, departing. So if you see him, uh, he'll be leaving us soon. That's it. Did you get your wildland crew hired? Say again? The wildland crew? Is um, it hired and ready to go? Correct. Yes, we're in the process. Yes, sir. Okay. So good. Yeah. Questions for Chief Council? I just saw they had the one of your big trucks, your wildland trucks, all up and ready to roll. <laughs> That's affirmative. Yeah. So. We, were, we got some maintenance done, some tires, took care of a, quite a few things. So we're happy about that. Several of the trucks are ready to rock and roll. So, yeah. yep. Great. <laughs> all right. Thanks, sir. Scott? Uh, just a big thing I've been working on is with the school, Lava Ridge, uh, the four juveniles that started the fire in our park, uh, setting up a program, got it all scheduled with uh, the school, officer ward, and then with our parks department, have them do some community service within our, uh, within Goobler Park, doing some cleaning up and all that to cut the, the cost down because, you know, they were 12 and 13 years old and to charge them with a felony at that age that we thought it'd be better to just take them out and do some manual labor, so. 
Uh, the parents all agreed. They're all on board with everything and getting that done. And then building wise, I got St. George refrigeration coming out, go through our uh, spring cleanup, get a few things touched up that maybe wasn't looked at for the last couple of years. So that's all I have. Questions for Scott. Thank you, Scott. Cody. Good evening. Um, building department's going well. Selena has been out. So we like to thank Christelle. Her name gets dropped. A bunch, but yeah, we we've been counting on her this week as as Selena has been attending a permit tech conference. So we're grateful for our administrators and Scott took pretty good care of them today. So otherwise, Fred's doing well, still swinging the bat for Dustin and filling in for building department and doing great. So thanks for your support. Questions for Cody? Jen, I don't have anything this evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Rock. Um, just a couple quick things. Uh, UIA, our bonds are tomorrow. Closing for those on the UIA, the UIA bonds for the fiber. Uh, Scott and Chief and I are meeting with the county on Monday. Came back with them on the EMS services out into the county area. And uh, next week is the work meeting. It's a pretty big agenda. We're at 10 items, nine, nine items. Um, one of those items uh, we discussed briefly at the League of Cities uh, regarding impact fees. We have that down as a possible item to come back and discuss about impact fee waivers. Do you guys want that to come back as a discussion? Or is there, I'll say, from our discussion, a consensus on where to go with those and to send an email back to the requester that mentioned that? And also, I, I'm all right with a discussion if we want to okay. talk about it in an open forum. I don't. I don't think it would hurt. Uh, I know, and the discussion will be solely just impact fee waivers in general. Just are we open to them? We want to yeah. go down that road, or are we not any to not to anybody in spe specific? So, all right, okay. We'll we'll leave that on the agenda. So, just so you know, FY nine items. So. I'll keep quiet. I'll do my best. Oh, you always look at me when it's a oh, big agenda. Look, like, I look at you because I, I know you're going to have food. You're going to say, uh, where's the food? I am. Um, do you want me to bring food? Oh, no. you want it, me to bring no. snacks? We'll, we'll take care of that. Oh, that's what I love. But that's all. Matt, did you have anything else? I uh, know. Oh, did you? Uh, we have an executive, you want an executive yes. session, right? Yes. To discuss character and competence of character employee. and competence of an individual. I need a motion to go into executive session to discuss character and competence of an individual council. So moved. Second. second. A motion by Ben, a second by Lena. Um, question on the motion. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed?